Live I think we're live again. Okay. Right, let's so try this again. let's 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 just just backpedal. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll we'll backpedal. My my phone's plugged in because it's it's low in battery, and the cord wasn't seated, and so it it wasn't charging. Went down to twenty percent. Pause the video. So we're gonna restart. So we're gonna restart the the little drought section of this whole thing, um, and and then we'll. For that beginning piece is going to be lost to the ether. It, it wasn't saved or anything like that, so we're just going to rock it from here. And restart. Yeah, we'll start restart. Over. We'll start over for from the drought management episode. The, All right. The first the first thing to consider what I what I had said before is that this is coming from what we've learned, not necessarily our personal experience, because we haven't been able, we haven't managed yet. We haven't managed through a drought. Um, so it's what Greg has taught us as far as how he, man he managed through the worst drought in Missouri's history, sort of his rules of thumb, you know, of, of tackling that sort of a situation. Um, and it's all gonna be related largely towards here in, in this situation. So as far as like rainfall amounts or temperature, <clears throat> temperatures or times of year, or durations of drought, that kind of discussion is gonna be very localized to here. So you're just gonna have to extrapolate to your own environment so to speak in your own situation but i'm sure there's going to be a bunch of this regardless of where you're at that's going to bring you some value so um yeah let's start with monitoring because that's what we were just just sort of wrapping up the the first piece is to understand how do you know if you're in a drought or if you're about to be in one so, so yeah a good practice as a as a grazer you know springtime's around you know you're still feeding hay and you're anticipating that new grass well, that first paddock when you're, you know, grazing completely grass, you don't have to feed any more hay, you know, you're grazing, you're off and running. That's the paddock you're gonna want to monitor both in the drought year and just in general, um, just to get a baseline for your how your grass is doing. Um, so that first paddock the cattle are in, every, let's say, week, maybe five days or so, come back to that paddock, um, measure the height of the grass. Let's say you left it, you know, eight inches or whatever, six inches in the spring, you left six inch residual. Then you come back a week later and, and it's grown an inch or two inches or however many. That's gonna give you a baseline as from year to year as to how well, you know, the grass is coming back and whether you're in a drought or not. So for example, let's say here in Missouri, um, you know, we've, we've the first paddock we've managed through, we left six inches residual. We come back two weeks later and there's a half an inch growth. That's a big red flag. That's something. There's something going wrong. There's also other pieces that you need to look at too. Is one being rainfall. So, let's, uh, again, let's say here in Missouri, let's say you didn't get any rain. You haven't gotten any rain from December, and it's already April, and it's dry as a bone out there, um, and you're starting to see also temperatures. Another thing to watch. So you're starting to see 80s, 90 degree temperatures in April, May. That's another big red flag, and it's it's going to be different in your environment depending you know, north or south, where you're at, east or west, same thing. Um, and so, you know, using those those three things, the, the temperature, the rainfall, and your, your grass growth, you're gonna be able to determine whether you're in a drought or not. And part of it is just, you know, getting that baseline down and understanding as a, you know, from year to year, what, what your grass is doing and how, how quick it's growing back. But if you if you get those signals that, oh, my grass really isn't growing, you need to really very quickly make your drought plan or have it in, you know, implement. Yeah, implement it. You, implement should, your you should have, and when we say drought plan, it's essentially just a plan of action, mm -hmm. right? So if I don't, if I, if I am indeed seeing the signs of, that's the first part of the plan is to monitor. If you indeed are checking those boxes of, you know, high temperatures very early in the season, not a lot of rain since the, in the late part of the winter, not a lot of regrowth compared to a normal year. If like all those things are sort of starting to line up, the, the biggest thing with a drought plan is like you wanna be acting before most people are acting in order to, we'll explain in a minute, but you wanna be enacting your drought plan. It's a lot better to enact your drought plan and then it rain three weeks later. Like that, that's, have too then, much you have, then the only thing you've got is too much grass and extra cash in your pocket, which we'll explain in a minute. But so first step monitor, like you were saying, if you start checking those boxes, like, yep, this is looking like it's going to be a drought. You need to start enacting, continuing to enact that plan as quickly as you can. Um, and the sort of big overarching thing is you want to be able to 
extend your rotation around your farm. Let's say in the spring, it takes 30 to 40 days for us to get around the farm. In, a, in say in a drought, like the worst drought Greg's ever experienced was about a 120 day rotation basically until they got a rain again. He, he so, tightened them down, sold enough animals, yeah, tightened them down enough to which, make that last. Exactly, we'll, we'll get into it in a second. But yeah, it's it, w- the most important thing is you're trying to match your rotation speed with the amount of recovery time you're gonna need, which is gonna be whatever. Insert your <laughs> length of drought, 100 days, 60 days, 120, 300, whatever it is. Um, so how do you, okay, I've got this many animals. There's two options, right? You can either feed those animals something to supplement them so that you can maintain your herd throughout the drought, right? Until the grass starts growing again, or you reduce the number of animals because you have a set amount of feed because it's not growing and you reduce them enough so that you're able to tighten them down and make your rotation last 120 days or whatever around your farm. Those are your two options. And we were instructed and understand that the option of feeding is not a route you wanna go. As far as like supplemental. As far as supplemental feeding, as far as hay or anything else, like especially what for what we're talking about, we're talking about grass-based systems. So we're not feeding our cattle grain. That's like a different discussion. But if you're if you're if you're supplementing with hay as like your feed during the year, during the winter, the non-growing season, one of the worst things that you can try to do during a drought is just be like, oh, I'll just hold on to all my animals and just you know feed all the hay that I bought for the winter or all the two-year-old hay I've got lying around or whatever. That's it's a big mistake. And that was something that I was like, huh. I wouldn't have necessarily intuitively thought that, you know, I think, well, I got the animals, like they're more valuable than the hay is, I might as well just feed the hay, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But we can get into this, but this is like, it's definitely a mistake. So the correct direction is to destock, but we can explain why, why you shouldn't be feeding that hay. You want to get into that? Hey, yeah. So think about it in a drought. So let's say, you know, the previous year you bought your hay at 30, $40 a bale, whatever it's going for in your your area, um, you know, you maybe brought in a hundred bales or something that next year, you know, you've got maybe 50 bales left over from the winter and you're, you're, you're going into summer and then it becomes a drought. You're like, Oh, I just got these, you know, I still have these 50 bales. I only paid 30, 40 bucks for them. I might as well feed them. You know, it's, it's good value for the drought because I don't have any grass, but what you don't realize is now during that drought, it's harder for farmers to, you know, feed or to make hay because for one, there's not enough moisture. And then two, everybody's looking for hay because it's a drought. And so the price of hay just skyrockets. Now maybe you're looking at $100, $120 a bale as opposed to $30 to $40. So even though you paid that $30, $40 a bale for these 50 bales, just because it's in a drought, they're now worth $120, you know, what the going rate is for hay. And so if you can get yourself in that mindset that it's not yeah. it's not cheap feeding hay because I, I bought these cheap but it's no longer cheap, cheap. the yeah. hay is no longer cheap <clears throat> just so like every time you feed a bale during a drought just think okay I'm spending hundred twenty dollars is this worth it to spend hundred twenty dollars to feed my cattle or should I you know yeah. like that's that's the uh, mindset that you should be developing mm-hmm. just because it's just such a Cause like a lot of people, well, I'll just feed this hay. It's gonna, it's gonna rain. It's gonna rain and next week. I can, I just know it's, it's gotta rain. It's gotta rain. It's you know, and you just yeah. keep feeding these the hay, and then eventually you're out of hay. You've got all these hungry animals. You're out of grass. What do you do? The sale barns are flooded. You know, you, you're not you, even taking cattle. They're not taking cattle. You're not getting any money for them. You, you just end up, you know, maybe having to shoot a lot of them or you know, put them down. It's like just a bad, bad situation to get in, and that's obviously extreme, extreme, yeah. extreme cases. Um, but but still, not that it can't happen. It's it's going to hurt you financially at the bare minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like we said, the worst thing is you. So the proper route is destocking. The worst thing is you destock. It rains three weeks later. Now you've got way too much grass. Mm-hmm. No one's ever. You know, no one's ever, you know, no one's ever like gone out of business because they've got way too much grass, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, so, okay. So now with that being said, all right, we understand you monitor, then you, then you start implementing the plan. You don't feed hay, you start to destock. How do you even go about destocking, right? Because there's a process 
to do this because there are animals in your herd and we're coming from a cow calf seed stock operation. Mm -hmm. There's animals in your herd that are worth a lot more money than other animals. And so the overarching goal through the destocking process is to do it in steps and start with your lowest value animals first, progressing to your highest value animals last. Your most precious. Your most precious. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. And then also this is again, the reason why you want to be acting early because you're monitoring because everything that you're selling, if you can do it early, you're going to be ahead of the curve as far as prices and markets getting flooded. And so if you can be ahead of the curve, those lower value animals are going to bring a higher dollar than if you fed hay, fed hay, fed hay, fed hay, and they're like, all right, I'm out of grass, I'm bringing it to the sale barn, and then prices are just absolutely in the basement. If you can even get them in. If you can even get them in. But if you can't get them in, you're still going to get absolutely nothing for them. Mm -hmm. Versus, worst case scenario, you destock, sell a bunch of animals, have a little pile of cash sitting there, it rains, you either, I don't know, invest in something on your farm, buy more animals in. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with, with some, some extra cash in the business. So, anyway, the process of destocking, though. The first... The first and least valuable animals that you need to get rid of first in a seed stock in, enterprise, yeah, in this yeah. enterprise is um, your your non breeding males, so your steers, any any male steers, and even if you have some some bulls that are breeding animals, but they're not your your top bulls, you can get rid of that, you know, get rid of them too. So steers, extra and, bulls, and, you know, extra bulls. You want to hold on to your top. Three, four, depending on your size of your operation, yeah. three, your your top, we call them like the macho bulls, mm-hmm. your, your best of the best your you're core. Gonna, that, that, that you're going to be breeding with. Those those don't get sold. But everything else, every other male can be sold. So that's the first step. The next step is... Well, I guess the first first step would be like anything you have on the chopping the, block oh, as yeah, far yeah, as a yeah. call. So like anything that you already were like probably going to bring her to the sale barn or him to the sale barn next week or two weeks from now like obviously those are the ones yeah. you go for you first. should always have a call list as to for for in the drop situation yeah. where you just okay these ones need to go bop, 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 they're gone and then that gets rid of a chunk of them and then you go to your yep. steers yep. and your and your bulls that you're you're not breeding or your non-priority bulls yeah those get gone now you're looking at you know now what you're left with is your females and your calves um and so um First thing you look at, which is kind of along the coal line, but yeah. any uh, pencil-legged heifers, as <laughs> yeah. Greg calls them, <laughs> yeah. any of your your lower quality breeding stock, breeding heifers, um, stuff that's a little bit too leggy that you that you don't you know then you'd like, or you know maybe they they're not built right, or they're kind of they got a little bit of a temper, or they're kind of scrawny, yeah, or something. like something if they have like knocks against them, you can get rid of the heifers or younger cows, and then. The next thing you look at is older cows. Anything, you know, eight, nine, ten year old cow. Yeah, she's still a good cow, but you know, she's starting to come out of her prime. You've got younger ones on the way up, so then they go first. So your your objective is one to keep, you know, your breeding bulls, because you need those, because you need to you need to be able to breed your cows. But the most valuable animals that you can hold on to is your your top heifers like that's the most valuable thing you do not want to i mean that's like last resort break into yeah that's like when you you just have no grass heifers and you have and, to get out of heifers and like really young cows yeah yeah like young breeding females, females. yeah and, and, and like prime breeding females like your yeah. best of your best those are your those are what you want to hold on to as as w- much as you can um yeah but that's kind of the progression yeah your calls your steers your non-necessary bulls yeah Pencil legged heifers, <laughs> old cows. Yeah. Then you just kind of work down, and at, at that point you're going to be pretty well destocked. Like that should be down to. You only need to like yeah. do you know like depending on your situation, you only need to destock destock to the point where you can make that rotation last long enough to yep. get, get through the drought. Yep. Um, yep. And and you can go and 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 obviously the more you. There's like different schools of thought because like the more you sell in the beginning, the better price you're going to be if the drought continues to <laughs> continues to happen. You could take the the mindset of I'm going to do it in stages where I'll take out 10% or whatever or 20% and then just see what happens and then sell another 10 or another 20 or whatever and just keep parsing it down until you know you're going to be fine for the rest of the summer basically if, if that's how extreme the drought's going to be. Um, and in this part of the country... 
that's really, I mean, 120 days is the worst one that, that's ever happened. And so, because when the fall rolls around, it's just the way that the weather pattern works in this part of the world, you will get moisture. I mean, it is unprecedented for it to just continue to roll through like a whole year. I mean, and then, but then there's parts of the country where it does. there's like 450 day droughts or 600 day droughts. droughts. Yeah, exactly. Like multiple, multiple years without proper precipitation. Um, and that's a totally different beast that we're not really equipped to handle, um, as far as our experience or what we've been taught. But, um, those are sort of the overarching themes. And so essentially what's going to happen is if you properly destock, you're going to be able to make it through the drought. Cause the other thing that happens during a drought is in this part of the country, because there's is so much rain, we grow a ton of grass, but the grass is lower quality grass because it's, it's washy. It's yeah. People will say washy because because there is so much moisture, the grass is not really stressed very much. And so there's a very little mineralization and phytochemical production happening in the grass, which makes it a lot more nutrient dense and satiating for the animal. And so they need a lot more grass in normal circumstances to do well compared to out West where they get a lot less rain, but the quality of that grass is a lot higher. And so in a drought, you almost get that like Western grass situation in middle of Missouri or somewhere that it doesn't usually happen because all that grass is so stressed from so little rain that all those phytochemicals and nutrients and stuff start to really intensify in that grass. So that actual amount of feed that the animal requires is less because it's like, it's like eating a really high quality, like protein bar or like mm -hmm. meal replacement shake or something like that. Mm -hmm. you, eat full fat. you eat full and it's not that much volume, but if you eat a bag of potato chips, like you could eat two bags of potato chips without <laughs> blinking, you mm -hmm. know? And it's like so much volume, but it's just not very good quality. Um, yeah. Another thing too is the parasite load just drops dramatically when in a drought. Almost no pink there's eye. There's no moisture. Same with yeah. the pink eye, same with the flies. Yeah. Like a lot of problems just disappear during a drought. So your animals will actually probably look, if, if you've destocked appropriately and they're getting enough feed, they're going to they're look, look phenomenal yeah. <laughs> like during the drought, even yeah. though there's going to be less of them. So that also will allow you because of that to, to tighten them up more than you otherwise would be able to, because there's almost more like usable feed per unit area mm -hmm. than during normal circumstances, which is kind of handy. So you are able to tighten down as well as sell off a lot of animals. And then you just cruise your way through that drought. You're going to have a pile of cash sitting there because you offloaded a ton of animals at the beginning of the drought. And then when the rain comes again, you can either just wait and let that core like build itself back out from that core genetics of your top breeding males and your top breeding females. Um, or you, any, or you can do what Greg did, which is go to a, another producer that has some extra stuff for sale. Good um, seed stock. the good seed stock. Maybe he was just a little bit outside of the drought. So it didn't get quite as hard hit as, as you did. And, and just buy, buy in some, uh, buy in some fresh genetics and let that sort of mix in and grow your herd out. So, um, that is the cool thing about that though, like about like keeping your, you know, whittling your herd down and then growing from there is it's like almost like a fast track to get to the quality you need. Yep. You're just trimming off all the junk and then you start from a better, better point. Yeah. And yeah, your, the amount of revenue you'll generate is going to decrease as yeah. a result, but potentially in the future, it'll be higher because you have a higher quality product mm -hmm. to sell. Um, it's kind of interesting. But, but another thing I wanted to say too is this this is works very well for a seed stock operation. As far as like a grass fed, you know, if you're feeding, you know, you're doing like grass fed beef. Yeah. I don't know quite. I don't really know the answer to to you know if, if you need to bring in twelve steers a week or something for your like, customer base you know, throughout or the summer. Like, I don't know whatever. what. Like there's, you're definitely gonna have to kind of twist and 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 turn it around to fit your operation. But some of the, some of these principles, especially like the feeding the hay yeah. is a big one. Um, you're just having, monitoring, yeah. monitoring, knowing being what early, your situation being is. Early, yeah. You know, maybe you can line up. I mean, now I know it's kind of crazy with butcher dates and yeah. stuff, but maybe you could line up, you know, a bunch of early butcher dates, stuff that might not be quite there and just have more ground beef than you otherwise would. Yeah. Just, you know, because you're butchering animals that aren't quite finished or whatever, but at least you're going to have some product and you might be able to charge more for it because nobody else 
that supplying and, area has it. Because they know? weren't prepared. Because they, they weren't prepared. Sell their animals to sale barns. Yeah. So, but I, but this is just pure speculation. We're yeah. just we're just shooting it, shooting <laughs> from the hip, so to speak. But um, yeah, I don't. You have any other you have any other thoughts about like I don't know, like if you were you're you're raising you know whatever grass fed beef operation during yeah. drought or I don't know. I mean, like, what do you think? I guess I have a question. The in terms of like. So that quality of feed goes up, right? Yeah. Let's say you're doing a grass-fed operation. Uh-huh. Would those steers turn out better because they, they have, yeah, you know, maybe. Like, would, would it be, you're talking about maybe selling them for a premium because nobody else has them, but it would also yeah. probably be better quality meat, It probably right? tastes better. Yeah. I wonder. I don't know. I don't know how much fat you'd put on, but I mean, like, I guess if you had a lot of, if, if you had a plenty of feed, there's mm-hmm. no reason why they wouldn't, you know? I wonder if you could, like, send out 30% of your herd somewhere where there's not a drought and like have them custom graze custom for you. Them. you know, yeah, I wonder, I wonder if it'd be something. worth it Yeah, as far as keeping your Especially if it's market. a localized drought. Like yeah. say like yeah. you're like you yeah. in Michigan like had a drought and you mm-hmm. could send it to so, like middle Indiana or, yeah, something. or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Central Indiana or something. Like not and a they, crazy. Like, you know, you just pay them, you know, this rate per day and they could finish them out for you. I mean, it obviously... You'd have to do the math just to, to figure sure. out like yeah, economically, yeah. how is that? How that's gonna pan out versus trying to sell them? But that might be a good yeah. play. Just because then you you still have got the animals, the animals, um, you know, the, and but because you, maybe you're probably you can raise your prices up because it's a drought. You know, yeah. like yeah. just be real with your customers. You know, this is part of life. Nature has its way of <laughs> can't raise beef without water. <laughs> exactly. And so just yeah. being real, and maybe you're able to then charge a little more to then make it. You know, makes sense. Be like, okay, if you want your beef, we've got to charge more just because of these situations. Yeah. You know, and make it work that way. I don't know. I just they I'm might, well, they might start donating to your cause. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or when you have beef again, they're gonna buy the crap out of it because mm-hmm. they know you like went through that that yeah. trial by fire, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. So or this is just it's just ideas. We're just yeah, <laughs> just throwing it out there. If know. anyone's got direct experience out there with with raising. Grass-fed beef, that's the central piece of your operation during an extreme drought. I'd be interested. Throw it in the comments. Throw it in the questions. Mm-hmm. Get in contact with us. I'd be interested to hear yeah, some thoughts. It's super, super. Yeah. We're both kind of really wanting to, yeah. really interested in the whole grass-fed beef side of it, too. Just yeah. you know, all three of us just learning. It's just another piece, it. you yeah. know? It's like another piece to the puzzle. Yeah. So Another um, kind of thing we don't yeah. know, really deal with or see. Yeah, so. yeah for sure. For sure. Well, you want to jump into some questions potentially if there's anything out there. Set. Well, let's true. So let's just wrap up. Let's drop. recap. Yeah. <laughs> monitoring. You know, monitoring your your rainfall, your moisture, and your grass growth in the that original paddock. Yeah. Or yeah, rainfall temperatures sure. and yeah, and your grass, grass growth. growth. Grass growth is the most important one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those three are your your key indicators as to, as to a drought. You know, in the springtime. So you monitor, and if you if you're in if you notice you're becoming into a drought, you need to destock. That's your next rule of order. And yep. In the destock order, culls, then to steers, then to secondary bulls, then to your pencil legged heifers, <laughs> then to your older cows, old grandma cows, and, and then, then your core group of heifers and young cows, young breeding females and is your prized possession and like prime breeding males that, but yeah and, and your prime but if you have to if it was gun to your head and you had to choose between your prime breeding females and your prime breeding males get rid of the males. get rid of the males because they don't give you a calf every year mm-hmm. so you could you can source you could try to source a you could try to source a bull from somewhere but that's like extreme extreme, extreme case. case yeah like um I man don't i don't want to think about it i don't know if that's <laughs> I don't know if you get to that point. Yeah, at that point, you might maybe, be out of the cow know, business. Maybe, but, but like at that point, like you know, you just keep two bulls, and maybe you sell like yeah. two bulls is not that much more. So you just hold on to those two yep. best bulls, yep. and then make, it might be worth selling two of the worst, worst of the best heifers just to hold on to those genetics. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, that's basically it, and it's just always about it's being it's about being early. It's better to oh, de stock. Don't feed hay. Yeah, don't feed hay. It's about being early, and it's better to destock than feed hay, and it's better to have too much grass because it rained three weeks after you sold a bunch of stuff off. Mm-hmm. That's a way better scenario than feeding hay, praying for a rain. It doesn't happen. 
bring stuff to the sale barn. They won't even take it. If they do take it, they're giving you like two sh- two pennies and telling you to, <laughs> you know, turn around. It's a terrible situation. Yeah. So just be proactive and have a plan. Just feeding hay. Oh, we forgot the is. important part. Take a vacation. Take a vacation. That's a oh, big one yeah. in the summertime. So in that in the drought of 2012, Greg and Jan, they had interns. I think it was Meg and someone else. Yeah. Um, and they. If if you guys Greg, are out there, let us know who it was. <laughs> Greg, Greg set up like 27, 25 paddocks ahead of time, and then him and Jan just left and went to New Zealand. For, yeah, New Zealand for three for, weeks. Yeah, for almost three a, weeks. Almost a month during the heat of the drought, and. And in New Zealand, it's like it rained every day. Every there. single and, and, day. <laughs> and he was just like, I mean, it was good for him. It was good for both of them to get that break away from the farm, get that break from the stress and just kind of recoup and come back at it. And he said he, he came back that, you know, after his vacation, the, the cattle had looked phenomenal because they were because of the highly mineralized grass and they were getting, you know, enough to eat and they were still moving and they were, so they're super, you know, still super content and the, and uh you know they made it through the drought and, it, yeah. and he was a lot better he had a lot better perspective and, and mentality going into it from that vacation so that's a that's an important one and you don't have to take a three-week vacation to new but, zealand <laughs> but um you can even just taking a weekend yeah or, just going or like to a cabin in the woods somewhere and just somewhere where it's raining no <laughs> yeah so, yeah exactly. yeah but and just just getting your mind refreshed so that you can deal with it because it's definitely one of those things where it's just a stress. It gets like a constant stress of like making sure you're trying, making sure you're making the right decisions, making sure that your animals are going to be okay, making sure you are going to be okay financially. Mm-hmm. It's it's a lot, and so just taking that time to reset gives you a little bit of rejuvenated energy to hit to attack it again when you come back. So um, yeah, because a lot of people will get into the trap of. Oh, I can't leave. I can't leave. Stuff's going on. Stuff's going on. If you left for a day, n- nothing will go to hell in a handbasket. I mean, as long as you, as long as you, you know, like Greg said, he set up a bunch of paddocks for his interns to make sure they were all set and knew what the drill was, and 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 off he went. So you could even give your your cattle two pet two days worth two days of worth of forage and give them that and leave and come back. You know, yep. it's not going to hurt the cattle that. You know, it's not really gonna hurt the cow, no. <laughs> and it's gonna be so beneficial to your own mental me- mental state that it will end up benefiting the cattle because yeah. <laughs> you're because you're gonna be making clear, more thought out decisions that are not just full of emotion because you're you're all drawn down from dealing with the drought so much. So mm-hmm. yeah, we almost forgot that. that was I know. One of the most I was thinking that. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So there you go. Have a plan. Don't pray for rain. Yeah, that's yep. a bad trap to be in. Yeah. Oh, it's got it's gotta rain. It's gotta rain next week. It's yep. gotta rain. Yep. Can't be a drought this long. Yep. Just hold on a little bit longer. Just yep. a little bit longer. Yep. Pretty soon your cattle look like skeletons and you're out of grass and you're having to put them down because you can't bring them to the sale barn. It's a bad, bad place to be. Anyway. Anyways. That was that was good. That was a good discussion. Um now we now we got questions, comments potentially. Um some. there are no questions. Really? Well, awesome. There are some comments, if you want me to read those. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Let's see. We got a... Uh, this is a great topic. Yeah, so, it is. It is a good topic. Um, I mean, with these, it's always we go... There's no time limit. So we'll, we'll just go as long as it's interesting. If if people are if people are, are satiated and satisfied with the discussion, and that's then good that's us. good with us. Um it's just but if you have questions you have don't questions, be afraid, don't be afraid to ask it doesn't have to be about drought management it could be about sheep it could be about what, what we, we had, had doing this spring what we had for dinner um it was beef stew even though it's like 85 degrees out yep not a very good not a, not a good decision no. but you know it was it was delicious it was delicious um um let's see we got one what's the sheep plan during a drought um it's per, it's, a, it's 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 pretty same. similar yeah I would say it's it's almost identical as far as as far as um, destocking destocking, yeah, um, and yeah, I mean it's the same progression as destocking and monitoring and monitoring and, and, and you know not feeding hay not feeding hay although the sheep the sheep will be able to make it on a you know they they eat low oak leaves in the yeah. winter so if you know if you have to. You, know, you can turn push them. The woods you can push, push them a lot more. more. Yeah, they, they'll do a lot better than the cattle through the drought. Yep. 
Um, plus, then the parasite load is very very minimal, low, so it's really good for good place, good time for sheep. Yeah, sheep do really well out west because of that because yeah. there's low parasites and they, uh, you know, highly mineralized. Yeah, for it's hard stuff. to raise sheep in this part of the country without yeah. proper genetics mm -hmm. because they just it, without like proper genetics and without worming heavily. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely difficult. So. Um, it's kind of a comment, but diversifying into a pasture of egg chooks is a drought strategy for our grass-fed beef herd. Hmm. Allows me to run a stocking rate lower than peak. So basically, like implementing, implementing uh, chicken, a, like ch like chickens more like or beefing up the chicken enterprise during a drought. Huh. It, I guess that kind of makes sense because you obviously, yeah, corn. you're buying feed anyway. It's not going to be affected by a drought. You know? It might a little bit, but not like hay. Not no, like hay no, 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 no. Especially since the feed you're buying is most likely not manufactured like down the road. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's probably somewhere. It's it's somewhere like well, it's it's probably somewhere oh. where where they <laughs> where it where, like the manufacturer is pulling from like a lot of different locations. Yeah. It's not it's not just from one spot. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but again, it, that yeah, it's interesting because it definitely would help supplement. For income, sure, yeah. Sell, yeah. sell some cows and invest in chickens. Invest in chickens, year. yeah. Or sell or some cows pigs and pigs, or, or, or something that whatever. requires feed. But then it's like, do you have the market to do that? You know, yeah. maybe if you, yeah, maybe if like, I maybe mean, if, if you were selling, selling a couple of them, yeah. or if you were selling a couple of pigs, it just wasn't a big deal. It was a little side enterprise. You just, just grow that. And just grow that. And then maybe after the drought, then you can go back to the cattle, and then you still got the pigs. The pigs, and then you just yeah. grow your business because yeah. of your drought plan. Yeah, that's an interesting <laughs> thought. Catapults you up a little bit. We didn't even think about that. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Something that requires feed rather than grass. Well, yeah. So the, there's where the advantage comes in. Mm -hmm. That's the well, feed that's not hay. You know. Yeah. 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 Feed that's not that's insulated from a drought. Uh, what is your average lamb slash you rate? Um, 1.5, 1.6. Yeah, I mean, last year was the highest that Greg's ever had, and that was 1.8. Um, I think we might be close. We this might year. be, we might even be higher. Yeah. We just have had a ton of triplets this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, for those sheep people out there, I'd be interested as to why, what causes triplets, you know, and like why it's do you have more of them? Good forage, although we pushed the sheep hard this year. Hard, yeah, and yeah. I don't know. We've been pushing them hard this spring. <laughs> yeah, so maybe they just need to be pushed. No. Um, need to be stressed. <laughs> stressed. Um, <laughs> stressed them out. Uh, no, but like 1.5 is like a is like a pretty pretty normal estimate where it's like you're you're gonna have mostly your older ewes should be having twins and your and your younger ewes will be having singles and so if you've got a mix of older and younger ewes in your flock you're gonna have those ones and those twos are sort of going to like balance themselves out to, mm -hmm. to, a, to a half, a half a lamb. There's a U in there, black dot. Yeah. She had a single last year and a single this year, but yeah. it's a nice looking lamb. Yeah. So it know. looks like one of our best rams. Like it, like it was the same color. Like mm -hmm. the two of them look exactly this, almost identical. We had a, we have a lot more color in our lambs this year. Cause we've, there's three rams out of four that have some color on them. Yeah. One is like almost all color. He's, he's like modeled sort of like rusty brown mm -hmm. on like on he's a white pretty. background. Super pretty. But we've got, I mean, that's the cool part about the lambs is that it is like every color pattern imaginable. Yeah, it's so cool. There's ones that are like mouse color. Ones that are dark, dark brown with like a white face. Mm -hmm. Some that are totally white. White little stockings. Or black stockings. Black or, stockings or spots it's crazy. or black bellies. And There's one that has like, like brown goggles. Yeah. <laughs> like white, like brown goggles. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah, but the sheep are, the one with the white tail. You remember yeah. that one? That's why it really, it's, it's, it'd be kind of cool. I mean, like, obviously if your market is, is South Pole or whatever, you got to do that. But if you had a herd yeah. that was just, um, like absolute <laughs> grab bag of colors and, so and unique. just so different, you know, if there was a lot of variability. You could remember then who, who's yeah, cat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, it's oh, like, oh yeah. They all look super different. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's some That's South African cattle breed that looks like a oh, Jason yeah. Jackson Pollock painting or whatever it is. It's, uh, it's like in Goonie cattle. Yeah, it's in Goonie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think they look so cool. But Longhorns have a lot of yeah. variation. Yeah. In their in their in their yeah colors and stuff. Uniform colors boring. I like, yeah. I, like <laughs> I like variability. But anyway. Yeah, I'm gonna, it's gonna bring up the the belted Galloway. The belted Galloway question. question all over again. Um, uh, 
Yeah. The one thing that is nice about white sheep, though, is that they're very easy to spot. Mm -hmm. Like when you have brown sheep or black colored or whatever, like spotted and stuff, they can hide a lot easier. Yeah. 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 Except in the winter time, and then they're invisible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's snow on the ground. It's so hard to see the sheep. Yeah. But anyway. And when the rams get out. Yeah. Chasing rams through the snow. <laughs> Where is he at? Where is he at? <laughs> Yeah. I had a thought when you guys were talking about the stressed, you know, stressed lambs or stressed ewes and stuff. Yeah. I wonder if it is a natural response to where they Any put way. out more lambs hmm. in a response to try and keep at least one of them alive. Or, I don't know. Yeah. You know, kind of like how, like, plants, when they're stressed, they'll put out. They put out a seed head really yeah. quickly. Yeah. Yeah, but it, then the, the counter argument to that would be like it's a lot harder on the mother to do that. to nurse yeah. three at the same time, which is and if they're already stressed, the forage demand. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, this is it was just we're a thought. Just, we're, <laughs> just throwing, we're just throwing something at the wall and seeing what sticks. Someone, someone in the comments is gonna is gonna let us know what what causes triplets in sheep, other than genetics, but because it's the same use effectively as last year for the most part. It's just. There's a bunch more that are having three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Um, Greg mentioned something about a cow named Deer. Is there a story there? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> this will be a good one. So, Deer is a, Deer was born last year. Um, she doesn't have a tag. She doesn't have a tag because we know who she is. <laughs> um, she, she Again, she's got a unique color pattern. Yeah. Um, she looks exactly like her mom. Brown on the top. And like white belly underneath, underneath. Um, like a deer, like a deer, and but the reason we call her a deer is because she is just spooky. Like <laughs> this, we're gonna sell her at some point because Maybe. <laughs> she's really she's she's really good looking. Like as from a build she's perspective, pretty. she's super pretty. She's actually calmed down quite a bit, and but she, she has was calmed down. For a while. So this was how spooky she was as a calf. I remember we were over on the ridge over here in the north place, mm -hmm. and she yeah, had been born for. I don't know, she's a couple, she's maybe a week old, something like that. Like, old enough where she wasn't a, just a newborn calf. She could get up and run around. And the grass was really long. And we just did a paddock move. And I'm standing there watching the cows, like, walk into the new paddock. And a cow's walking, like, on the edge of the paddock. And it spooks deer, the, the little okay. calf. Not an actual deer. Not an actual deer. The one we call deer, the calf. And she jumps up it was just the, like i was way i was watching from a long way away it was a cow okay the cow spooks her she jumps up and she takes off across the paddock through the fence through another fence <laughs> and then out into the like the main strip of the runway and just off like towards the road and we were like well hope she comes back you know? <laughs> and, she did. and she did but i mean the fact that i mean it was a cow it wasn't like, <laughs> like she's she's laying down amongst cows the entire day Right? There's no, it's not an abnormal thing. For I think what it was is she was in the new paddock laying down in the grass yeah. until when they all came in. But still, but there's still, cows, there's balling, cows and balling and stomping around. Yeah. It just made no sense. And then the other thing that happened this year is for a period of time, we were putting salt bags, like little tea bags in the water. They were just essentially like sacks of, <laughs> sacks of like salt that like oh, in, okay. in, a, in a feed sack essentially. So it was... So, so it's, it's perforated, right? So we were getting a sort of a salt brine or water, or whatever is this thing we were working on earlier this spring. So the, the, on the tire tank, there's a cross piece that's like a PVC pipe that keeps the cattle from getting into the tire tank. And so we tied the little piece of baling twine to the top of the, to the cross piece just to keep the bag from floating around. And we're sitting there watching and deer comes up to get a drink. She walks up. And she sees the thing floating in the water. She almost falls over. She runs away so fast. Like, oh, my God. What was that? And then she'll, like, she, like, stop. stop and then, like, creep up to the edge and then lifted her head up over there. And then scared herself again and went running back. Like, there's something in the water. There's something in the water. We finally just left her. We finally just left her. She was, like, all night she was trying to go get a drink, but she couldn't let herself. And there was something in the water that wasn't usually there. Oh, my goodness. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, we need to sell she's, her. She's a piece of work. But, um... She I she's, haven't noticed her recently. Yeah, she's, she's calmed, calmed down. down she also has the funniest voice. It, it sounds like a... I don't even know how to do it. It's like a... It's like it. super high super pitched. High pitch. It's like a whistle almost. <laughs> it literally <laughs> said it's like a whistle. She's calling for mom. It's like a whistle. It's so... She is so funny. But and she's like a 600 pound, 400 pound 
Probably 450 pound calf. Yeah. Man, she's bigger than that. She's now. probably like probably six. Like 600 yeah. pounds. Heifer. But she sounds like, I don't know. Like yeah, a, it's I don't like, even know what It's like a whistle. Like. It's like, oh. <laughs> And it's just like she's the only yeah. you can hear just walking through the paddock calling oh. for her mom. And her mom had a calf like you know, like a couple weeks ago, something like that. Little bull calf. Which her mom moved up. I was yeah. surprised. I and didn't... her mom is the is abnormally calm mm. compared to the rest of the herd. It's <laughs> yeah. not like her mom's a piece of work. Her mom you could walk up and you could probably basi- touch. you could basically scratch her on the head and she wouldn't really care. I mean she'd sort of amble off the other direction, but I mean, very she's laid not back. Spooked. She's not spooked. Very at all. laid back, and she has a little bull calf this year. Doesn't have the same pattern. And he's not spooky. And he's not spooky. At least not yet. Ah, uh, he's kind of spooky. Yeah, maybe his but, sister's rubbing off. But on not him. like, not like <laughs> crazy. Like he's that. Well, he's that one the other day when we were trying to get him through the gate. Me and you when mm-hmm. he was getting the four or something, and he ran past us. But then we got around and he was. Oh yeah, you know that's, he's not like not like <laughs> he's deer. just a little weird. He's just a little bit spooky, but it's <laughs> anyway. like a normal calf, yeah. you know. Yeah. Know. She, anyway, that's the story of the deer. So if you hear Greg talk about the deer, <laughs> that's now you know. Now you know. Now you know. Um, are you guys clipping pastures right now to keep seed heads <laughs> off if you can't get the mob to it quick enough? It's more following the mob behind the mob. Yes, you, you never want to be cutting in front. Mm-hmm. Never cut in front, always behind. And no, we're not just because there's like two inches of water standing in the ground. Not really. It's like, so wet though. It's it's when I say it's it's rained every single day for two and a half weeks, that is not an exaggeration. Almost every single day we've gotten a little bit of rain for the past two and a half weeks. And so going to keep doing that. Yeah. So yep. until it dries up, Greg's not getting his tractor out on the <laughs> We were talking about this yesterday, sort of jokingly, but Him, you and no, no, you, you and me, when we're, like the three of us, when we were walking with those with those people who came to visit about brush hogging. Oh yeah, yeah. Brush hogging is kind of funny when you think about it because you don't want to do it late in the year because it's you don't want to be doing it in the dry period because you're not going to get a lot of regrowth. But you can't do it when it's really wet because you're going to be rutting up your pasture. So there has to be this Goldilocks zone of <laughs> dry, but right before a rain, that's the most ideal to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, which is just kind it's of really the only time you can do it without yeah, tearing, without something, tearing up something up or sacrificing forage. Sa- which it essentially at that point is sacrificing winter feed, mm-hmm. which we sort of experienced to some extent on some paddocks this, this past winter. For sure, places that got brush hogged later in the summer, we got very little rain early fall, and it hurt us on a stockpile, on the stockpile front um, mm-hmm. in the winter a little bit. But um, but you can't do it when it's this wet because you're gonna leave ruts this deep. So it's just one of those deals. It's got to dry out a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Got to dry out a little bit more. But it's definitely something that it's something that Greg definitely does a good amount of if, if, if he's able to do it and it makes sense. Um, yeah. Cause it's like when it's raining, like, the, like if you're going to get rain, it does come back much more power for back. the cattle. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like better feed. Like then it, like if you don't clip, then it's super woody and mature and the cattle don't do as well. But if you can clip behind them, it's like giving them like this buffet salad bar. It's yep. beautiful. But, but exactly. It's every time it's a roll of the dice. If you do it and you don't get a rain, you shot yourself in the foot, mm-hmm. but if you're pretty confident rain's gonna come, it can it can be a real a big advantage. You can increase your gains by a lot mm-hmm. doing that. So and also it, it cuts down on pink eye a little bit too because they yeah. don't have big like uh, sticky woody pokey things that are irritating their eye as they're grazing. Mm-hmm. So when it's nice and lush and vegetative, you don't have that issue. Mm-hmm. Something else to consider, and there's more energy in the yep in the in the forage, which also it's helps combat. Liquefied. Also helps combat the pink eye. Pink eye. Yep. Yep. Any more? For each of you, the funniest thing that has happened since the last chewing the cud. The funniest thing that has happened. I've since got the one. last one. All right, maybe the, it'll spark my memory. The funniest thing was Isaac messing with one of the calves. <laughs> And oh like, my God, yeah. so he just like, they, they do little like flicky motions with their head and he got down and like did the same thing to the calf and it did it back and then he did it again and then it did it back. <laughs> we were talking, and then, I was communicating. Yeah. And then she like moved to him like, like multiple times. 
Mm-hmm. And so just like a little she tried to headbutt you a little oh, bit. Oh, it too. was so funny. It was yeah, it was like she was trying to they play fight and stuff. And so it was like she was trying to do that with him. And it then she just, let me pet her, scratch yeah. her head. Which almost never happens with calves. Yeah. They're way too freaky. After you tag them, they don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was funny. Man. 137. 137. Mm-hmm. We're going to groom her to be the next 864. <laughs> For people who are familiar with 864. She's the farm pet. She's the farm pet. For no reason. She wasn't a bottle calf, nothing like that. She's just incredibly that tolerable of eight, getting scratched. Eight, as if she loves three, it. The bull, the big boy, yeah. let me scratch him on the butt today. Yeah. <laughs> he was up moving. I'm like, come on, buddy. And then I started scratching. He's like, oh, that feels good. <laughs> that feels really There's good. There's another one, like 918 you can pet as long as you move slow. Yeah. And, and 998 or whoever that was, I got a picture of her sniffing my hand. And she was doing it Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 787. Is one that's yeah, there's and there's an older cow with no tag. They're like a blonde one with no tag that I was scratching on the head today. Oh yeah. Like no problem. Yeah. It's like <laughs> there's some that'll let you. Yeah. Especially if you're you're easy. That eight forty, that heifer, mm-hmm. the one that was riding the other day, yeah. she's she she'll let you do it a little bit. You just gotta move slow. What is, what does be... Ian say if you wanna catch a monkey, you gotta move slow? Something like that. <laughs> oh yeah. What yeah. But anyway. Um <laughs> I don't know what I don't know. What is I, that? Can't, I can't think, think of, of what it is. I can't think of. Um, I can't think of anything. I'm trying to think of something. Oh, that funny! That's funny. Oh man. Um, my family came. Nothing super funny happened there. I don't think. Uh, man, I don't know. I don't know what. That was a good one. That was good. I forgot about that. I totally forgot about that too. Man. Yeah, we have no fun here. No. <laughs> all, all business. I don't know what Connor's talking about. Laugh. Funny. We never laugh. We never laugh. Play games. Or anything. No. I don't know. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing super. There was something, but I just can't think of it. It's like. Yeah. Anyway, nothing funny happens here. That was um, funny though. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. It was. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to think Sorry about that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have fun. Yeah, we have no fun. <laughs> no fun at all. All right. Um, what about feeding alfalfa pellets as a supplement during a drought? It is technically a grass just. Is it mm-hmm. technically a grass just pelleted? Yeah, it's it's alfa dried alfalfa that's pelleted. Yeah. Pelleted. It's gotta be expensive. It's gotta be expensive. Maybe a lot of times. I mean, if a lot, of, you know, if you're getting, you know, alfalfa from, a yeah. lot of times it's either irrigated or because it alfalfa needs a lot of water. water. It's either irrigated or it's in a place that's got water, so it's probably not, you know, it doesn't. The drought it's probably wouldn't be affect. Expensive though, but yeah, as far as way. feeding, like, also, is there, is there a risk with bloat with alfalfa pellets? I don't know if there is because it's the moisture on the the legumes that yeah. really really affects, like dew in the morning if you graze, yeah. you know, if you graze clovers or, or alfalfa in the morning you can have a risk of it so i don't yeah. think the alfalfa pellets i bet it'd just be prohibitively expensive yeah. to do it on this kind of a scale it. it wouldn't be worth it eat on any kind of a scale um, yeah if you're doing it for a business maybe for the grass-fed beef just to like supplement it a little bit but i don't know like enough about it i don't know how yeah. much it, i don't know how much it costs like per yeah. pound and what, yeah. it, what it's like in you'd have to do the whatever. numbers yeah but my gut says no this would be way too expensive <laughs> It's much better to have the money in your pocket from destocking than an alfalfa <laughs> Yeah, trying to make it through the drought. I would, yeah. I would say. I don't know. Yeah. You'd have to do the numbers. Interesting, though. Have you guys ever messed with the wet-wrapped hay bales, um, maybe silage bales? Thoughts on them? Not here. I did a little bit in my old job. Um, they, you've got to, you've got to wrap them really well. If you have any kind of a air leak, it just turns to mold. You know what it's doing is it's fermenting in the, in that. So it, you, Did that heat up. Uh, I don't think so, but it's it's uh, anaerobic. Oh, okay. So it's not like it's like decomposing. Yeah. It's just fermenting. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think it is. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it you know probably <laughs> burn. Yeah. But basically, like you take green chop, which is just freshly cut pasture roll it up in a bale and then wrap those bales in like heavy duty plastic um i think so like 
this is like a whole discussion, <laughs> but with the with with fermented foods, fermented foods are really good for monogastric digestive systems, like for us, for pigs, for chickens, um, for for a ruminant system, their their rumen is fermenting the food, and so when you when you feed them fermented foods like, you know, silage, I think what it does is it creates very like acidic. It puts a lot of acidity. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, there was something I was reading about it. So it's, it it's not as it's meat. not as well. It's not as good for cattle. I mean, they gain well on it because it's you know very high in nutrients and stuff. But as far as like their digestive function, I don't think it's very good for them. And it's like there was something I don't remember if it was with corn or with if it was with silage, but like E. coli um, can survive in acidic environments. And and yeah. out and like in alkaline environments, if like cattle are out grazing, yeah. they're more alkaline. Their e. Col- the e. coli can't you know pass through. But when they eat, is either corn or silage or something. Yeah. E. coli can you know develop and then in the beef, and then you know if like the manure gets on the beef or whatever, like then we can kind of contract the e. coli from the meat. So yeah. I don't, I don't I don't know. There's there's a lot of science to it that I don't really know, but I've read that somewhere. Yeah. I think Joel Salatin wrote about yeah, you're, it. And you're, this. you're you're way off the deep end as far as what yeah. I as far as what I understand, mm-hmm. but <laughs> it makes nothing checks out in my head. If yeah. That's that's yeah. any that's any consolation to anybody. I I think there's I mean I don't think the the silage is as good for cattle as like just grass. I yeah. think it's it's hard on their digestive system. But I'm not a rumen or I'm not a, a rumen nutritionist. nutritionist, so I don't. I don't claim to be. I've just read that somewhere, or heard it somewhere. So yeah. take it for what it is. Maybe we'll have a ruminant nutritionist. Maybe the, maybe I'm completely wrong. And just, ah, this is not right. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna find out though. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Put it on there. Put Tell me there. if I'm wrong because I want to know. <laughs> Comments down below. Um, how do you cull sheep out if you don't tag? Uh, we do it visually. Mm-hmm. So. Um, we, I mean, we get them up. I, I, I read in the comments from last week's or like last week, the last episode that we did, we talked about sheep. Um, and there was some confusion as to when I was explaining or whoever it was, um, how many times we get the sheep up and when we call versus sell. Um, so just to clarify that and answer this question at the same time, we, we get the sheep up basically twice a year. Our sheep sale to our customers for seed stock happens in August. And then our culling sale, which goes to the sale barn, happens in July because we cull and we castrate like sort of on the in the same moment, so to speak, the same instance in the corral. We're sorting off our culls and we're castrating our, our, our rams that we don't want to sell as seed stock or keep for ourselves. Um, and then... We get them up again in August and sell the stuff to the sell stuff to the to customers. But how we make that decision in July for calls is it's just visual um, because we don't have tag numbers. We don't understand who came from who and that you know any sort of lineages with anything or we 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 can't like mark down you know this you in December looked terrible. We need to get rid of her. We don't do that. It would be it'd be advantageous if you could. It's just it's not something that. We do because the sheep are a secondary enterprise, but we just do it visually. So sheep come in, if they look scrawny, if they've got dirty tails, if they've got like a weird swollen jaw, if they've got a limp, like anything that's off, they don't look prime and healthy because that's the like peak forage condition is in the, or peak forage is in the, is in July. They're on some of the best pasture will be on all year. If anything, the grass isn't super protein heavy and and so they're not gonna have dirty tails unless they have worms um, or some sort of parasite. And they should just be looking awesome at that point. All shedded off, um, shed off, shedded, shed, shed someone? All shed off. Shed off, off. Yeah. sounds awkward. Um, Unshedded. Um, <laughs> oh wait, no, they do. <laughs> all shorn. Un- un- unhaired. <laughs> automatically shorn. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, those are like, it, it's all visual. We just look at them. If they look bad, we get them in a group and we'll bring them to the sale barn. We sold 55 of them last year. It was a mix of bad looking ewes and limpy rams and withers that weren't going to be worth anything. And all those guys got rounded up and we brought them over to the sale barn and trailer. So. Also throughout the year, 
if there's a couple ewes or whatever that get runny tails like later in the season or you know whenever um we'll go in there and like if it gets if they get really like really, like, really, really bad. bad we'll go in there and, and uh take some you know shoot them and and take them out just because we don't want those spreading parasites, parasites to everything else. throughout the rest of the flock and they're not going to probably improve we're not going to worm them because that's not what we do here we'd rather just you know remove, the genetics. Keep, remove the genetics and, and keep the flock healthy um, and you also wouldn't you wouldn't get anything further from them no. at the sale bar nobody and, and you, you can't really butcher them because they're they're so it's strong so, so full of worms so. and or whatever else you don't want that contaminating anything and a lot of times it happened like it'll happen maybe you know going into winter and so at that point it's kind of nice to destock a little bit just because it's less feed you got to bring them yep. through in the winter yeah but, but if you were tagging it yeah. would just be another it was, yeah it would just be another element of information that you could use to be a lot more stringent with your sheep flock you'd get to a lot better spot a lot quicker and you'd have a lot less animals that are falling out of the herd or flock every year um for us it's just trying to be as low maintenance as possible making sure that it's just what what we can manage as a side enterprise you know mm -hmm. it's all about managing workload it works and it works it works out yeah but if sheep was your full-time gig you could definitely i'd look into trying to figure out a system depending on if you had 300 or 2000 yeah like if you had yeah. 2000 i don't know if yeah would but, but <laughs> even but even like even um uh greg brand's system where he puts a tag in when something's wrong and then like puts a notch in the tag to indicate what it was. You know yeah. what I mean? Like foot problem or like thin or runny tail or mm -hmm. whatever I like whatever he was talking about looking at the looking at the eye. Hey, <laughs> I've just been working his lasso skills. Um, but yeah, tag indicating what it is, and then later on in the year you could you could be able to call him understand too. like yeah, call him later because you can understand like yep. This one was did this in the winter time. We don't need it. You know what I mean. So, yeah. Anyway, Isaac's been lassoing. Connor has too. Yeah. Yeah, we've been playing a version of pig horse and pig. What, what, you know, you've you just been lassoing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've just been lassoing like a log. The hedge posts. The hedge posts. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we've been playing cow. Our, of pig. Yeah, we yeah. Play cow. Yeah. Our lasso skills as a group were embarrassingly bad oh my goodness and we don't have to use them very often but when we do it'd be nice it'd be to nice be to, to be able to do it at least so, a little bit yeah we basically have to like walk up and put the lasso over the top <laughs> of the animal that's how bad it was luckily they're docile enough yeah, to do that for the most part, but yeah. it'd be nice to be able to do it <laughs> for certain instances it'd be so handy if anyone's got any tips or tricks oh yeah as far as that so way send them all away we need all the help we, we, can, help get. we can get. <laughs> Greg's not very good at it either. No. He's he said his dad used to be incredible at it. Yeah. yeah. But he didn't. Yeah, I guess he did never took the time to learn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Greg. Um, oh, Greg. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, there's a ton. Oh, um, man. Oh, yeah. Man. So we'll just spark the, discussion. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just have to shut her, shut her down when we feel like we want to shut her down. Probably um, another five minutes or so. Yeah. Sound, sound about right. Another sounds, question or two, depending on how long they are. Uh, besides Coriente, what breed would you like to see cross with Talpole? Uh, long time listener there. <laughs> Gallo no, not Galloway. Cause it's no, like, well, um, cause that's like the Galloway Shona? has very good hair. The Shona would be cool. Um, Dexter. Yeah. Greg really wants to see somebody do it with a Dexter mm -hmm. just for his own <laughs> I intrigue and to see what, would, see what would happen. <laughs> Um, I'd like to see like a like a British white maybe they're, yeah. they're good, good or Murray Murray Gray but we already see that in Goonies Murray channel. Gray or so cool. yeah in Goonies no that'd be crazy what color would that turn out to be who knows every color yeah it's especially like a four way cross anyway um, I'd like to see a, a Murray Gray herd bred Murray to Gray South bred Bowl. to South Pole because we have they're one so pretty we have one Murray oh. Gray. He, Greg's had a couple over the years, and it's, it, she's not full Murray Gray. Somebody asked that, like, would we keep that bull if 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 she because she had a bull calf yeah. this year? Would we keep it for seed stock? I think it would just depend on the customer, probably, and if he turns out to be a good bull. He's a little bit framey, even as a, even as a little guy. So we're just gonna have it's to watch. It's so early though. So yeah, it's hard to. It is hard to effort from last year is beautiful. And, but what I was gonna say is she's not full blood Murray Gray. She's yeah. half or. She might even be, I think she's half. Yeah. She's like, so her offspring 
if it's a hundred percent South Pole Bowl, which it is, it would be three quarter. Would be three quarter South, South Pole, one one quarter Marie Gray, which some people might get a little bit bent out of shape about. Some I for might one love it. definitely would not, I just would because not. to me it's it's more about the performance of the animal than it is the genetic, the genetic the, the pedigree, pedigree. The pedigree. Pedigree is better word. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, beautiful though, and her heifer from last year is just, I mean, unbelievable. A yeah. A beauty. So that would be a cool cross. I Murray agree. Gray, Murray Gray. Murray South Gray. Murray Gray herd to South Pole. To South Pole Bulls. Yeah. Yeah. That that'd would be, be so sick. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I think that'd be my favorite. Yeah. Oh, just to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, what else? So much to do that. Yeah. But like, it's just such a, well, the reason we talk about it all the time is it's just such an, or talk about crossing all the time is it's just such an interesting Mm -hmm. thing because the South Pole is so is such a good grass genetic base that it'd just be super interesting to be able to add something on to that you know and just sort of see where it took you Mm -hmm. um which is which would be kind of cool I mean South Poles are great and there's a lot of other great cattle breeds out there people always ask us that like what (laughs) would you would you use South Pole if you like started your own herd it's like what do you want me to say yeah, probably, <laughs> if I could get my hands on There's something. There's a guy you know, in, yeah. in northern Indiana that's selling Murray Grays. My uncle was going to get some, some Ooh, semen out of them. Yeah. But maybe that's a there you feature. Go. <laughs> yeah. Because they're local, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Let's see. I also I really like Galloway, but they wouldn't be a very good cross with South Pole just because... You get a lot of hair. The Galloway is, like, the, one of their strongest traits is that they have, like, a in the wintertime, they have a coarse coat with a, like an under duff, I guess, like a, a real fine hair. So it's like insulation. Um, so if you bred to the South Pole, it'd probably mess up a lot of the, mm-hmm. either the South Pole's slick hide and the, you know, the Galloway's, Galloway's thick hide is like, but you maybe you'd get the best of both. Maybe they'd slick off in the summer and, yeah. and. Or you just get a watered yeah. down version of both, you know, it's probably <laughs> yeah, a slightly happen. slicker Galloway and a it's slightly like, hairier South Pole. It's like, <laughs> what are we doing here? Yeah. But that might be, I don't know, if you live yeah. in a somewhat cold climate, it's like somewhat, hot, is climate. somewhat hot, like yeah. Michigan. Yep. I don't know. Could be, be a solution. Yeah. Definitely not good for Tennessee. No. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> yeah. Very one slick. 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 Slicker. Slicker. <laughs> Slicker than a snake. Slick. Oh, that's slick. That's slick right there. Slick. Another <laughs> Gregism. Um... Are you testing the pH of the urine when testing out the minerals? We did do a little bit of that. Um, Greg brought some pH strips out there. Just a barely. barely. Um, Not like... I don't remember what it was. It was slightly alkaline, wasn't it? Yeah. It was like Like 7 or 8. It was like 8 to 8.2 or something. Yeah, which is what you want, I guess. I don't know. Someone, someone, let us know. Where's the cattle nutrition? At? I know. We need, we, need to, we need to get our, we need to get somebody on speed dial. Several, down. yeah. You several. Uh... Yeah. Lifeline. <laughs> hey, uh, Joe. All right. We got one a, more, maybe. One, one more? Two more, depending on how many we got. Um, there, I mean, there's a lot, but find, find, find something. Find a, find a good, find a doozer. Doozer. Huh? Find a doozer. Find, find one. Uh. Either a doozer or, or unexpected one. Yeah, like a, a good, good ender. Something, a good note to end. Pressure's on. Pressure. It better be a good one. It's not on me. Yeah, it is. It's on you gotta find people it. asking the questions. Yeah. <laughs> Start typing like mad. My thumbs don't move fast enough. Okay. Um. One of these days we'll get this also on YouTube and then we're not going to know what to do with ourselves. Brrr, so way too many questions, questions to so read. I'm going to take it back. All right. To drought management. Let's okay, let's, let's go for a full circle. I like it. When moving the animals in a drought or a summer slump, you tighten them down, and they're moving slower across the farm. Wouldn't they be taking the grass down short? It's a good yes. it's a good question because I I I went I remember one last year I went to a long DM conversation with somebody explaining how this works. Um, Whipper Will's going outside. Yeah, Whipper Will. Um, <laughs> Every night. Yes, Every you night. are. You're going to be taking it down <laughs> yep. and, and but, but like we were saying earlier, that grass is going to be a lot more mineralized. So And there's not the parasite load. There's not the parasite load, so you don't really necessarily have to be worried about taking it down too far. Um, plus, it's 
a... By doing that, you're buying a longer recovery. Exactly, period. for the rest of the farm. So it has longer time to come back before it's back, so a longer time to recover. Long, yeah, you can overgraze as long as you overrest. Not overrest, but rest appropriately, mm -hmm. you know? So if you take it down way shorter than you were intending, that's fine, as long as you give it a long enough time to get back to where you want it to be. Because the thing you got to think about is, yes, we're taking it down that short, but they're there for eight or 12 hours, you know? Yep. It's not like they're we're, we're making them stay there and just keep cleaning it up day after day. And something that Greg's also said that he learned from Ian is that that um, litter bank that you have on the, you know, so in a normal year you've got green grass growing and in theory there should be a, a carpet of like dead, de like partially decayed, you know, old um, fescue or grass or whatever that's been trampled on the ground from the previous graze. Um, and that's insulating your soil and is a huge part of the whole process. But in a drought scenario, you can actually graze that or they'll eat that or graze it down so you, or you don't have that litter bank. And you're, you can do that. You're allowed to do that as long as you put it back. Then, like the next time you come around and it's not a drought anymore, make sure, you maybe, maybe wait it. for it. Yeah, maybe wait for it to get taller and then just knock a ton of it on the ground just to replenish that litter bank get that soil covered adequately again. Um, so yeah, you will be taking it down more, but you're increasing time and that's what you need during a drought is time. So, yup, exactly. That was a good one. Good one to end on. Good yep. job, Connor. Nice. All right. Thanks everybody. <laughs> I'm sorry that there's a ton of questions you didn't get to. Ask them quicker next time. No, uh, uh, no, it's all good. Answer quicker, you suckers. Uh, um, I'm sorry about that little technical difficulty at the beginning. You know, it's part of it. I got a tripod now, so maybe it'll be a little steadier than it has been. We'll sort of see and in, in how, how it ended up turning out. But thanks for listening, hopefully, and watching. Ho hopefully we'll be here next week. Same time, same place. Um, I'll, ready I'll, to get after ready it. Ready to get after it. I'll throw something out there if that's not the case. But thank you. And, uh, yeah, we'll see everybody later.